The global economy faces its most challenging moment since the Great Depression at a time when technology promises to radically redefine our relationship with money. Hello, I'm Michael Casey, Chief Content Officer of Coindesk. Welcome to Money Reimagined, the first show in our global consensus distributed live cast. Joining me throughout this hour will be filmmaker, podcaster, reporter, and public speaker extraordinaire, and I might add, a fellow Aussie from my hometown of Perth, Naomi Brockwell. Welcome, Naomi. Absolutely delighted to be here, Michael. And it is the first in many years that I have not emceed consensus. So I'm very much looking forward to this distributed version of the, the event. It's uh, going to be a lot of fun. Well, you're, you're still contributing an incredibly important and uh, you know valuable effort here for us. So but anyway, don't worry, folks. We promise not to digress into colloquialisms about meat, pies, Vegemite, that sort of stuff. In fact, the topic really is far too serious. We've got a convergence of forces, economic, geopolitical, technological, and now this devastating pandemic. All of it has the potential to change the financial system as we know it. So to explore this uncertain landscape, we're bringing in intelligentsia from both the traditional finance and crypto communities. And we're starting out with one of the economic thought leaders of our time, Lawrence Summers, a professor and pr pr president emeritus of Harvard University. He served President Bill Clinton as U.S. Treasury Secretary and President Barack Obama as Director of the National Economic Council. Secretary Summers, thank you so much for joining us. Very good to be with you, Michael. So, uh, Secretary Summers, to, to frame this discussion, I want to start by throwing a five-year chart of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet at us. So, it's pretty striking. That's actually twice as much an accumulation of assets, that is, you know, quantitative easing, than happened in, you know, that those tumultuous times around September and October in uh, 2008. But it, perhaps it's inevitable, right? The world needs dollars desperately, and the Fed's providing them by buying up all manner of assets, including even junk bond ETFs. It's unprecedented. I'm just wondering, what do you think the legacy of all this will be? I don't think there was a viable option if we were to preserve a viable financial uh, system. This is one of three moments of existential threat after 1987, after 2008, 2009, and now this in the context of uh, the pandemic. I think it's important to recognize what's on the other side of the Fed balance sheet. This is not a case where there issue <laughs> pure money, which by definition has a zero interest rate. This is a case where they're issuing bank reserves for the most part, and those bank reserves will pay whatever interest rate the Fed sets. So in that sense, they have rather more the character of short-term government debt uh, than of uh, money. One would be a fool not to recognize uh, that the inflationary risks, given the magnitude of this dislocation, are greater than they were uh, three months ago. But at the same time, uh, there was a very famous letter written by a set of economists uh, to Chairman Bernanke in 2010, in which they explained that the uh, growth in the Fed balance sheet assured major inflation down the road. It's now pretty clear that that letter with respect to those events was wrong. And I think what about the assurance that this growth in the balance sheet necessarily points to an inflationary uh, period um, would not be a uh, sensible uh, judgment. I don't think the market participants who have traded break-evens down or reduced the price of commodity prices, even forward commodity prices, have necessarily been irrational. Yeah, but I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's certainly a massive deflationary moment right now, and it seems that this is going to go on for quite some time. But I suppose the bigger thing is when you say down the road, is there at all any risk that the Fed's independence, I mean, there's no choice but to do this, I, I agree. But um, is there any risk that the Fed's independence, as a result of having to take on all this private-related obligations, uh, is, is at risk here? And what does that mean for its capacity to manage monetary policy in the future? I think you're going to see um, more blurring of the roles of the Treasury and the Fed. You're already seeing it 
in these joint facilities that are being operated where the Fed, where the Treasury is providing uh, the risk uh, capital. When you think about issues relating to financial stability as uh, central, when you think about bailout type activities as critical, inevitably there's going to be more overlap in the roles of monetary and fiscal uh, policy. So yes, I think uh, that the high point of central bank independence has been passed. On the other hand, I think there is a reading of uh, monetary history in which we had a major experience with unanchored money in the 1970s and a very broad social lesson uh, was learned. And so I, I think there will be closer relations between treasuries and central banks, but whether that points to a new inflationary era, I think that's more likely than I did uh, three months ago, but it's not something I'd be prepared to go out and predict. Uh, right. right now. Sec Secretary Summers, Bank of England Governor Mark Carney last year proposed a new basket-based digital reserve currency to get the world off its dependence on dollars. What do you think of that idea? I think it's a long shot. Uh, I, think it's a I think it's a very long shot because I don't think there's the necessary political roots of consensus on how there would be global governance of uh, a major uh, currency. I don't think anybody's going to entrust that level of responsibility to uh, the IMF or to an institution like it, or certainly not to uh, the United Nations. And I think the experience is that uh, currencies are like uh, languages. Once they become established and established in having a global role, there tends to be a lot of uh, persistence just because of uh, the network uh, effect. So Mark could be right. He's certainly uh, visionary on this, uh, but I think Mark's other dream around uh, much more active finance around global climate change is likely to happen much sooner than uh, his bank core. I think it will be a pretty substantial step if we got as far as the substantial growth in SDRs, special drawing rights of the IMF uh, that has been proposed. And I'd be surprised if we saw this uh, soon. In some ways, that means uh, less public competition uh, for private uh, digital currencies. Uh, you know, the ECB is exploring a digital currency as well, uh, Secretary Summers. And in fact, we've got, we had ECB Executive Board Member Eves Mersch earlier on recording a presentation for us. Going to listen to a clip of that if we can quickly. A retail central bank digital currency could be based, for example, on digital tokens which would circulate in a decentralized manner, that is, without a centralized ledger, and allow for anonymity towards the central bank, imitating a essential feature of cash. Some argue that a token-based digital currency might not guarantee complete anonymity, and it could be designed in an intermediate way. If that were the case, this would inevitably, however, raise social, political and legal issues, especially in those countries for which it has been commonly accepted that banknotes are printed freedom. Alternatively, a retail CBDC could also, for example, be based on deposit accounts with the central bank. A CBDC of this nature would enable the central bank to register, of course, transfers between the users 
it would have as an advantage to offer protection against money laundering or other illicit uses or what the ruler of the day considers to be illicit. And uh, this all would depend on the degree of privacy that we would build into the design of such a scheme. Secretary Summers, what do you think of Governor Mersh's comment about the privacy challenges of a central bank digital currency? If the US were to create a digital dollar, should it incorporate privacy protections and how should they do this? I think the problems we have now with money involve too much privacy. I was one who pushed very hard for the step that Governor Draghi and his colleagues uh, took to eliminate the 500 euro note or the new printing of the 500 euro note. All you really had to know about those notes was that their nickname was the Bin Laden, to know that they weren't a very good idea. In a world of inordinate uh, tax evasion, in a world with trillions of dollars of uh, laundered money around corruption and uh, the drug uh, trade, I think the last objective of uh, government policy should be the promotion of anonymity with respect to large uh, financial transactions. One of the financial community's accomplishments has been some progress with respect to uh, issues around uh, bank secrecy. And I would think it tragic if we were to turn backwards in some jurisdictions in an effort to get some sovereignty revenue were to go into competition by offering uh, anonymous uh, stores of value. If there's a case for uh, central bank digital currencies, I think it's exactly the opposite. I think it's a case that's around e equalizing the playing field between smaller and uh, larger uh, players, and it's around making it more difficult for anonymous forms of uh, finance uh, to uh, flourish. But of all the important freedoms, the ability to possess, transfer, and do business with multi-million dollar sums of money anonymously uh, seems to me to be one of the least important uh, freedoms that governments uh, should be working uh, to preserve. So I, I think you'll find some folks watching this show might disagree with the idea that there's too much privacy and money, Secretary Summers, but we have a wide tent and we are taking every view here and, of course, some very valid points there. That's all we have time for for right now. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you giving uh, this, this, this effort to have a chat to us in this important event. Thank you for being with you and good luck with uh, your event. And if I have provoked others, I will have uh, served my purpose. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Secretary Summers. So don't forget there are deeper dives into these and other topics within the consensus distributed experience. Right now, there's an Ask Me Anything session with former Commodities and Futures Trading Commission Chairman Christopher Giancarlo. If you've registered for the conference, you can find it and all the other great additional programming by navigating to chosen sessions and tracks via the scheduled tab. If you haven't registered, you really should. After all, it's free. Naomi. Thanks, Michael. Even before